Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the College of Church's Sunday morning streaming service. Uh, Connie and I had the opportunity a week ago to be in the cities and they dedicated the Richfield Post Office to my dad. Uh, the memory of my dad was sort of a cool thing. A right, congressional act. Ooh. <laughs> Let's open a word of prayer this morning. Lord God, we come before you now with the need of you. Lord, we thank you for everyday miracles. Don't let our unbelief cloud our actions, Lord. Lord, I ask you to take care of the school kids. Keep their minds, their spirits safe, and their bodies. Lord, there are those in our congregation that need healing, that need companionship. Lord, I ask that you would bring people to them, around them, such that those needs would be taken care of. Lord, I ask these things, and oh, before I and this, Lord, I ask for peace in Jerusalem, a secure and lasting peace. Let the non believers over there get their eyes open to the truth, Lord. I ask in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Let's praise the Lord this morning.
the righteousness that you have already to us through your death and your resurrection on the cross. Just praise the God that you are the one that lights up fire. You are the one that gives us vision and hope. Thank you, Lord. And let everything that has to us praise you. If you're breathing today, praise me.
Yeah. 
Thank you, worship team, um, and welcome to visitor. Today, I don't, I'm not going to say names since we're live streaming, uh, but we've got some visitors today. Make them welcome. And for a pastoral prayer today, uh, I, I noticed that it was grandparents' day today. Uh, and one of the things that I admire most is when a grandparent or the elderly in some sense are still living hard to pass the baton to the next generation. And so I'd like to pray from uh, today. I'm using the ESV. We're in Psalm 92, if you'd like to turn there. Psalm 92. I'm going to read three verses and pray. I'll pray after these three verses and turn to one more. Psalm 92, beginning in verse 12. Beginning in verse 13. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is the only rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Heavenly Father, you say 70 and by reason of strength 80 and many are out doing even that. Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, that our older saints would still be planted in the house of the Lord. There's a place for them. May they grow here and be strong. May they provide shade and covering over the next generations. Obviously not in their youth, obviously not in the way of their youth, but still bearing fruit and more precious fruit. I think of, is it Galatians? I'm in the pains of childbirth again until Christ is formed in you. Lord, may they know that fullness of womb in the spirit of intercession to bring forth the next generations. And may they ever abide with the tree of life upon their tongue, speaking words of life to the next generations, declaring your praises, your excellencies, your glories, and that your word and your way is good, very good. If you turn over to Psalm 103, I'd like to pray one more verse. Psalm 103, verse 17. Oh, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to their children's children. And may I ask, Lord, their children after them. Lord God, give us the heritage, the legacy of being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of being the God of um, Sarah, Rebecca and Rachel, may it be true for us as well. 
Give us the generations of our children and our grandchildren and their children after them should you tarry for a thousand generations. We ask you. Father, I was thinking of the four or five verses that hint at household salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. You and all your household. I don't fully know what those verses mean. I know we need to come individually to you, but they're there as an encouragement. May our households, Lord God, be filled with believers from first to last. Father, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. And now we'll receive an offering if the ushers would come. <clears throat> this isn't the missionary march yet. This will be our... I brought them up here. <clears throat> this is for our missionary, and I gave you a heads up about him, and many of you are already familiar. Everything plus that goes into the mission basket, in other words, we'll almost always add to it, anything that goes in the wicker <clears throat> baskets will be 100% for our missionary, Russell Stendhal. And then any gifts that you have for the church, if you have a regular tithe offering or own, can go in the wooden baskets. Father, may your blessing, you give us seed for sowing and you give us seed for consumption. May we have discernment as to which is which. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. And now... Uh, Joyce, are you leading the? I can't. I can lead. Would you lead the missionary march and then invite Russell to come and speak? Sure. After Russell speaks, Pastor Bernie will close the service. Lord be with you today. I'm going to go back and sit by my family. <laughs> Okay, all right, children, let's sing together. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Shades of brown from dark to light, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Shades of brown from dark to light, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Got one more. Here she comes, our sweetie. Okay, thank you. And this, today's collection, oh, time is We'll go to Mr. Stendhal and his missionary in to Colombia for many generations. So, I would like to introduce to you um, Mr. Stendhal. He is, has been a longtime missionary. Um, um, Ralph's wife is a sister to his mother. And uh, he has many exciting things to tell us about what he has been doing in Colombia for all this time and what, what the current news is from Colombia. I think you will really enjoy hearing from him. So. Sorry about that. Oops. And thank you for singing the new version that's from Answers in Genesis again. And a good, solid organization. I don't think anyone would question, but uh, it was meaningful to some. Yeah, speaking of Answers in Genesis, they uh, have uh, 
been supporting us for quite some time with some substantial um, resources. So, um, my friend Larry Pierce, um, who is the one who did the software that helped us with our two Bible translations, he lives in Toronto, outside of Toronto, in Canada, a computer genius, and then he started working more and more on the Bible, and he has a um, Bible program called Online Bible is one of the best computer study Bible programs that there is, and it will tie in with all different um, editions and versions of the Bible and, and support materials. And our Bible is on this program. And um, Larry's sister runs Angus in Genesis. And um, I've never met her, but uh, Larry helps us do answers in Genesis. And, and they send materials to homeschoolers all over North America. Hundreds of thousands of homeschoolers receive materials from Answers in Genesis. The, um, what was I going to say? I wanted to thank you folks, too, for supporting us for all these years. I can remember coming up here when I was just a kid with my dad. And um, you've been faithful supporters, not only financially, but with prayer support for all of these years. And um, the results have been astounding of what God has been doing in Colombia and in the neighboring countries. The I enjoyed your, your praise and worship this morning. The You sang some songs that I've never heard before, but they were excellent. I particularly like the one about um, asking God to relight the fire because God is the only one that can light the fire of revival. You remember in the Old Testament uh, when God told Moses how to build the tabernacle and the altar and then God lit the fire on that altar and told them they were to keep it burning. Never let it go out. Never let the fire on the altar or the fire in the lampstand or in the golden altar of incense to go out. And Israel got into apostasy on numerous occasions and overrun by their enemies and that fire got put out several times. But there are at least two occasions in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament of God relighting the fire. And when, if God doesn't light the fire, then, according to Scripture, it's false fire. And that has really bad consequences. Remember, Aaron, the first high priest, lost two of his sons that went out and tried to minister with false fire. And there were other cases. And today we have people that are trying to drum up a revival on their own. And uh, a friend of mine calls that playing with matches instead of... Uh, relying on the Lord. And those false fire revivals eventually come to a bad end. But probably the most famous time that God relit the fire was in the days of Elijah. Do you remember when God sent fire from heaven in a confrontation between the false prophets and the only one true prophet that remained? That was the prophet Elijah. And then um but earlier, you remember that things had become very corrupt in the tabernacle during the time of Eli, the high priest, and his two very corrupt sons, who are called sons of Belial, uh, sons of the devil, really, in Scripture. And God uh, brought judgment there, and the Philistines destroyed Shiloh, where the tabernacle was, and extinguished the fire. But God relit the fire during the time of King David. Uh, we don't have time to get into the story of how that happened at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, which later became the site for Solomon's temple. And it is also thought that that was the site where Abraham sacrificed Isaac and God spared Isaac. 
And so those are the two main times when God relit the fire. And then uh, that fire was there for when Solomon built the temple. And you remember when the glory of God filled the temple, it was so intense that the priests couldn't even minister. But now, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, the Scripture says that we are the temple. We are the temple. And so in the New Covenant, when God relit the fire, guess how he did it? You probably remember the story in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on the early uh, believers, it, uh, there were tons of fire on each person. We know that there were about 120 people in the upper room when that happened, and we know that there were men and women, and probably children, too. And over each one, there were tons of fire. So God didn't relight that fire over in the temple where they had just got done kicking out Jesus and, and, and killing him. He relit it in the people that were committed to him. And so if we want God to relight the fire in us so that it can spread to others, the place to start is with a solid and total 100% commitment to the Lord. The people on the day of Pentecost that were in the upper room, they were committed and they were in one accord, the scripture says. And it is very hard to get Christians in one accord today. There are so many different ways that division has hit the people of God. And Probably one of the most terrible things that's happened to the Protestant churches around the world is church splits. It is so easy to have a church split. And I've seen whole denominations split sometimes over very, very um, unbelievable little details. We saw a, a very conservative, very legalistic de denomination in Colombia split. Guess what they split over? Half of them thought that women should never ever cut their hair. And the other half said they thought it would be permissible for the women to trim the ends of their hair once a year. So they literally split hairs and all separated. I went, uh, I've been to a lot of different types of churches. And, uh, and I went to one, and I didn't know it, but they were about to have a split because someone had told them that steeples have a pagan origin. And there's a lot of things about that that I won't get into. So half of them in that church thought that they should take a chainsaw and saw the steeple off of their um, building if they were, in order to have a revival. And the other half thought that that wouldn't be necessary and so they were right ready to split when I got there and I didn't know anything about anything but the Lord used that time that I was there to um, focus them not on uh, whether to solve the steeple or not but rather to put their hearts on the altar before the Lord and let the Lord deal with anything that was wrong in their hearts and the, there's, there's so many things that we can get into having to do with traditions, having to do with symbols, having to do with ceremony, having to do with even what some people call sacraments. Um, well, I'll share this story. There, there's a group in Colombia, and maybe they're up here too, called Jesus Only. And um, they're big on water baptism, but it has to be done exactly the way they say, or else they don't think it's valid, and they think the person is saved by that water baptism. So this guy who was uh, head uh, honcho in that denomination started listening to our radio ministry. And somehow somebody gave him my cell phone number, and so I got a call from him. 
And he said that he wanted to congratulate me on our radio ministry, but that I was doing two things wrong. That he was going to point out to me. So I said, okay, yeah, what up? And so he, he said, well, for number one, um, I don't like some of the music that you're playing on your station. Uh. And uh, uh, we'll get into all the details on that. But when we're giving solar powered radios fixed on our frequency to drug traffickers and gorillas and uh, other undesirable people, and plus to soldiers and drug growers, there has to be something to hold their attention. So we use neutral and positive value secular music. to draw in the audience. Not wild music, but music that will definitely touch them in their soul because their spirit isn't alive. And if we just give them spiritual music, they'll throw the radio away. And so they've got a pre-evangelism and evangelistic channel on the radio that if they get converted, then all they have to do is hit a button and then on the other channel, all they've got is Christian music and teaching and preaching. To feed them. But this guy didn't like that. He didn't understand that. And then he said, but the, the really big mistake that you're making is you're not pushing the right water baptism. And this was Mr. Water Baptism. He was the only one that knew exactly how to do it. You had to dunk him three times and you had to say exactly the right words. And if you didn't do it right, they wouldn't be saved. So, um, it, 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 it's always been a, a wonder to me how they could not believe that there's three separate persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet they want to they want to dunk them three times. <laughs> but anyway, um, I said, well. I'll make a covenant with you. Because if I'm wrong, I certainly want to be straightened out, but I would want the Lord to do it. So how about if we both agree that wherever we're wrong, we will um, ask the Lord to intervene and straighten this out. So he said, yeah, yeah, oh, oh I'm going to agree with that. So we hung up the phone and a couple of weeks later, I got a call from him again. And he said, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And I said, well, what happened to you? He said, well, I had this dream. He said it was the most vivid dream. It was more vivid than being awake. And he said, I dreamed that I was in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus said to me, I have an issue with you. I have a problem with you. And he said, but well, Lord, I'm doing everything right. I mean, what problem could you possibly have with me? And the Lord said to him in this dream, the problem that I have with you is that you're not baptized. This is Mr. Water Baptism. The only one knows how to do it right. You know? And he says, well, what do you mean, Lord? You know, that is exactly according to these scriptures that I have here. And the Lord said to him, the water baptism described in the scriptures is only a symbol. The real baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire, I'm the only one that does that. And I've never baptized you and you're not baptized. Well, that got his attention. And he did get baptized in the real Holy Spirit and fire. And it didn't take long before his denomination kicked him out of <laughs> But he's still going strong out there someplace for the Lord. <laughs> my, my father was in, studied in uh, Northwestern Bible College for a semester because he wanted some Bible background when Billy Graham was the president. 
And my dad was there when the student body took up an offering that helped launch Billy Graham into his first crusade out on the West Coast. But my dad says that Billy Graham told him that he had been water baptized four different times and still didn't know if he got it right. <laughs> if we get caught up on things that aren't the center, the devil will be able to pry us apart. There's huge divisions in Christianity over how to pronounce the name of God. And basically, the Jews a long time ago decided they were not going to pronounce the name of God. And when they came to that sacred name in Scripture, they would simply say Adonai, which is Lord. Hallelujah comes close. It, it pronounces half of the name, which is the job at the end. And basically translates to praise the Lord. Except for it's not Lord as the sacred name, the first half of it. And you remember that the name is translated exactly when God first spoke it to Moses in the book of Exodus. And he simply said, I am that I am. And God's name has to do with his nature. And God is the only one that has eternal existence. And so the only way for us to have eternal life is in Him. Yeah. Scripture is clear. The Father has life in Himself. And He's given unto His Son, to the Lord Jesus, to have life. But our life, where does it come from? It's in the Son. If we have Jesus, we have life. If we don't have Jesus, we don't have life. So friends, the center of Christianity is Jesus. Without Jesus, there's no Christianity. And the life that we have, if we do have eternal life, is in Him. And the way that this works is via the Holy Spirit. And he is the only one that can baptize someone in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now he can use people. In the New Testament, when the apostles would lay their hands on someone and pray, God would send the Holy Spirit. And that could happen in conjunction with the water baptism. Or... Just them laying hands on, on people. Or several instances of people being filled with the Holy Spirit where, where nobody laid hands on them. Like at the upper room and like when the Holy Spirit came upon the household of Cornelius, the Roman centurion. Peter had just started to speak. He, he didn't even finish his message. He didn't even get very far in his message. He just barely started to speak when the Holy Spirit fell on all of them, just like what had happened in the upper room. And uh, Pastor Tim, uh, uh, regarding what you said earlier about um, being saved together with your household, when the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius, it fell on his whole household including some Roman soldiers that he had there serving him. So, God's plan has to do with families. He likes saving individuals, but he, he loves to save entire families. When he got into a friendship with Abraham, and it turned into a friendship with Abraham and his whole family, but his descendants. And when it hit the third generation, it became the nation of Israel. 
And Israel is one of the names of God that he puts on his people. And today, those that are the true people of God are the ones where God has dealt with their hearts. That's what Romans chapter 2 says. A true Jew has a circumcised heart. So that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to deal with our hearts and get us out of the legalistic mindset of trying to make everybody else just like us. When God deals with people's hearts, then the goal is for us all to be like Jesus. One guy was reading our books and seemed to be receiving the message well. And then he came to somewhere in one of the books, I still haven't found it, but where we said we went to some place and took some musicians and one of them had a drum set. Guess what happened? The guy threw everything out. Because according to him, drum sets are of the devil. And it wasn't even that we had a drum set or that we did anything. It was that we took someone somewhere that, and, that, and the person had a drum set. That did it. As we go closer and closer to the return of the Lord, which is still impossible to predict, but we know that it's got to be getting closer. The devil is throwing everything he can to cause trouble. Look at the kind of attacks that are happening to even little children that didn't used to be happening. There's a lot of trouble out there in the world. But the closer we get to the return of the Lord, the closer that two Christians become. Because we begin to see that Jesus is the reality and we all need more and more revelation of him. Right. And the better we get to know Jesus and the more he's revealed to us and the more he reveals the Father to us and this all happens via the Holy Spirit, the less important these little details are about whether somebody has a drum set or not or whether some Logan is a steeple or not, or whether some symbol that you've been using, where did it come from? Or what word you're going to say in a communion service or at a baptismal service? I think when Jesus comes back, none of these things are going to be all that important. The important thing is Him. The important thing is having a relationship with Him. The important thing is having a clean heart. And He's the only one that can cleanse our hearts. So unless He comes on the scene with the Holy Spirit and the fire of God, our hearts will never be cleansed and purified. And if our hearts are never cleansed and purified, guess what's going to happen? Nothing but trouble. Started with fights and conflict in the family and in the extended spiritual family. So I'm not trying to promote universalism because there are some things that we can't let go. Jesus is the Lord and he is the only way for us to be reconciled with the Father. There is no other way. The scriptures, at least in their original 
uh, when they were written, are completely inspired by God. There's not even one word out of place. And sometimes we can get confused by different translations that do things different ways. But in order to understand the scriptures, we need the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, and even if your Bible isn't perfect, the Holy Spirit will bridge it. He will show you if you're taking something to a legalistic extreme that God didn't intend. The, the symbol that, that God made that represents the scriptures, I believe is the lampstand that was in the tabernacle and then there were ten of them in Solomon's temple. If you make a lampstand according to the instructions in the book of Exodus, there are 66 features of gold that get handled together into one lampstand. And I believe those 66 features represent the 66 books of the Bible that were just beginning to be written when God gave those instructions to Moses. And see, the lampstand is no good without oil. And in addition to the oil, there were wicks, and the wicks had to be trimmed. So in order for us to be able to receive light from the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit is essential. And... That which is represented by the priest having to trim those wicks, we need to be under the discipline of God the Father in order to grow, in order, in order for the written word of God to fulfill its purpose in our lives. Another way of putting this, in Scripture it says, the letter kills but the Spirit brings life. And you've all seen what's happened when somebody gets into the dead letter of the Scriptures, like my um, friend that called me on the phone. He had it all reasoned out of how you had to do these baptisms and what he, but he was wrong. And he was fortunate enough to have Jesus personally straighten him up. And if we are in doubt about something, God is in the business of resolving our doubts. God didn't get mad at Gideon when he put out a fleece. He didn't get mad at Gideon when Gideon wanted to do the fleece the other way around. <laughs> have the first, you know, have the fleece be wet and around it be dry. Well, then have it the no. But once Gideon was convinced that it really was God, he went. And risked his life to do exactly what God told him to do. That's what God was looking for. So if we're not sure about something, and we really want God to resolve it, he will one way or another if we continue to keep asking. It's when we know for sure what God wants and we don't do it, that is what causes defeated Christians. And when we know what God wants us to do, in order to be able to do it, we're going to need grace from God. So, if you're getting your spiritual direction from someone else, even if that person is in tune with God, there's a limitation. Because unless we're hearing from God on our own, it is likely that there will not be sufficient grace in order for us to do the will of God. The grace to empower us to do the will of God comes from a direct relationship with Him. 
And Jesus doesn't want us to stop with coming to know him. He wants us to know him. And he wants to baptize us in the Holy Spirit and fire. But the whole purpose is so that we can come into a relationship with God the Father. Into the realm of answered prayer. I just finished writing a book on the Psalms and another one on the life of King David. And of all the things that he asked for repeatedly, he, he never asked for money or for anything of this world. His number one request is for mercy. He wanted mercy. He wanted wisdom. He wanted understanding. And God granted his request. So much so that the scriptures mentioned the sure mercies of David. In other words, David got into a realm of God where mercy wasn't hit or miss. He got into a, a relationship with God where he could count on God's mercy. And then there's something else that gets described there, which is the key of David. It's only mentioned once in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. But the key of David is operated by Jesus. And when he closes the door, nobody can open it. And when he opens the door, nobody can close it. I've been down a few to a few doors that I thought was God and it wasn't God and it was the devil opening the door and once we went through those doors it, it was nothing but lost time and effort and totally put us in a sidetrack. We don't want that to happen. And it takes a 100% commitment to the Lord so strong that the Lord will intervene and close the door if he doesn't want us to go through it. And no matter what we try, we can't get it open. That's security. And when God opens the door, nobody can close it. So, the Lord has been applying this to our ministry. And we've been seeing some phenomenal results in Colombia and other countries. In the middle of a revival, the life of which I've never heard tell of or seen or know anything about where God is multiplying people. Just to give you one example, I, I, I know a guy who is just a typical drunken native from a tribal group. Totally useless. Nothing but trouble. But about 15 years ago, the Lord got a hold of this guy. And Turned his life completely around. Well, not only turned his life around, but this guy's commitment was, was so strong. I, I could tell it was a strong commitment when I first met him because he had an old chainsaw, which is his pride and joy, and an old motorcycle. You know, chainsaw and a motorcycle, for them, that's doesn't get any better than that. You know, that's um, maybe, maybe the next thing will be a cell phone. The, and these are people that don't have anything. Well, he sold this chainsaw and he sold his motorcycle and used the money to start building a church building. Because he has a vision that a lot of people are going to come together there. And I got there just in time for us to help expand it. You know, he, fortunately, he built it high and then we could extend the eaves. And so uh, I gave him a thousand dollars worth of tin roofing, and he was able to put together a building where he could fit six hundred people. Well, last December we went out there for his annual leadership conference, and his leadership team, just his leadership team, is now six hundred people with their spouses. He's now coordinating more than 220 congregations 
And this has all happened in the last 10 years. I mean, we did a few more things for him. Like we've poured tens of thousands of Bibles. Both Bibles in his native language and full Bible in Spanish. And lots of books. And we gave him a sound system and a generator and a motorcycle. Can you imagine a better investment? And why? Because this guy's clean. He's clean. And God likes to multiply people that are clean. And this kind of thing is happening all over the place. Particularly in Venezuela. Little church two years ago started with 30 people over in Venezuela. Now it's at 600. And these aren't isolated cases. This is happening all over. Another place where the building holds 600. And if you want to go to that church... Um, they give you, a, uh, there's a sign-up sheet. And um, you sign up what service? They, they run services all day, every day, and every night of the week, and twice on Sunday and twice on Saturday. And like if you say, I want to come Monday night to the Monday night service, then they ask you not to come any other day of the week because they need the rule for other people. There are churches that have been receiving as many as 200 new converts in a single day. I mean, think of that. What, 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 what would you do if that happened here? I would bring the legs. Yeah. <laughs> But think of all the dirty diapers, you know, of all these baby Christians. You know, think, think of. I would still read the <laughs> They didn't have Bibles. Huge churches, sometimes nobody had a Bible in the whole place. Didn't get Bibles. And if the pastor had a Bible, then he would write the verses on a blackboard and everybody would copy them in a notebook. But then things got so bad in Venezuela, there's no more paper. He couldn't get notebooks, couldn't even get a seat of office paper for years over there. And it started to get better over the last two years, but now we think it's going to get worse because of the election problem. They're going to probably get hit with international sanctions again. It's probably going to go bad when people start to get. But that is what helped the revival because the only way to stay alive was to surrender to the Lord. And the pastors with all these people flocking into their churches would spend 90% or more of their time trying to make sure that nobody starved. In other words, if you get the whole church, you know, who, who, who has enough food for two meals a day? Would you be willing to only eat one meal and share a meal with somebody that doesn't have any food? Those are the kind of decisions you're going to make. When you couldn't get paper anymore, and they couldn't write down the Bible verses anymore, then guess what they had to do? Memorize. Memorize the scripture. That's not a bad idea either. That's the way how things traditionally have been done in Christianity. It wasn't for, for the first 15, 16, or even maybe even 1,700 years of Christianity, nobody had a personal Bible. Either the people didn't know how to read, or the, the printing press hadn't been uh, invented yet, and uh, you know, to hand write out even one book of the Bible was a very costly thing. Only, you know, maybe an entire congregation could have one or two books of the Bible. Or maybe a very wealthy individual could have a collection. But your average person couldn't. And if they did, they probably didn't know how to read. 
But they could listen to the Bible being read and they could memorize. In the Jewish system, by the time they were 12 years old, every Jewish boy, the goal was to have memorized the whole Torah, the whole first book, five books of the Bible. And if they wanted to go on and, and, and be a rabbi or teacher, then they had to memorize everything that was available. The prophets, you know, Isaiah, the song, everything. Compare that to me, you know, I, I got in trouble when I was in fourth grade. I shot a, a hornet's nest with a slingshot after my teacher told me not to. And I did it while she was too close and <laughs> she got stunned. <laughs> Didn't realize she was where she was when I shot that. But anyway, my I after that she made me memorize the entire book of Philippians. <laughs> <laughs> Which wasn't a bad thing either for a fourth grader. But um I've had some really great teachers over the years. But by the grace of God, we have been able to get hundreds of thousands of Bibles smuggled into Venezuela. And that has helped. You, you can't create a Bible. I, I mean, you can't, you can't create a revival by preaching good messages or by distributing good Bibles or good books or, or by good radio programs. Only God can start a revival. Only God can light the fire. But once it's lit and once it's going, we can help things stay on track. It's dangerous to let a revival go with no Bibles. Cults will come in, and, you know. People say, well, why don't you use, just use the New Testament? You know, um, New Testament's one fifth of the Bible, and so you can, for the same amount of money as one Bible, you can do five New Testaments. Yeah, that's right. But everybody that's ever done that, that I've ever known about them doing it, has repented ever having done that afterwards. Because there's huge problems. Now, there is a place for New Testaments. We use them in the military, we use them in schools. We, you know, but as far as churches are concerned, you need the whole Bible. Why do you need the whole Bible? Because, number one, if we don't give them the Genesis account, some other cult is going to come in and give them a false account. And mess them up royal. Number two, it's important for every Christian to understand the old covenant, to understand how complicated that was. If, if, if you know, if you're trying to get yourself clean after you knew you'd done something wrong, <laughs> under the old covenant, it could take you weeks or months. It could take cost an awful lot of money, sacrifice after sacrifice, and ceremonial washings, and and, and just on and on and on. In order for people to appreciate the new covenant, it really helps them to understand the old covenant. <clears throat> and then the third point is the Old Testament is full of prophecies that still haven't happened. Some of them have been fulfilled in the first coming, some of them have you know application to our personal lives. But the main bulk of the Old Testament prophecy is about the second coming and beyond. And that hasn't happened yet. And if we don't give them those prophecies, then uh, there could be a problem with their hope. Because our hope is that Jesus is coming back for us. Our hope is that if we die before he returns, that we'll participate in a resurrection and have the opportunity to reign with him. The scriptures say that hope is the anchor of our soul. Remember, there's three things that endure. Faith, hope, and charity, the love of God. But hope is incredibly important. Because if we lose our hope or if our hope is deficient, nothing else is going to work properly. And 
And I'll close with this, of what we were singing about, how God so loved the world. John 3, 16, which of course is the center of the gospel. But I'd like to define that word for you because our English word doesn't catch the Greek word perfectly. In Greek, there's several words that can be translated as love. The two main ones are phileos, which is brotherly love, or uh, love, human love, where we love somebody else because there could be some benefit for us out of it. But the word that used there is not the normal word. It's, it's the word for God's love, which is agape in the Greek, as opposed to phileo, which is the brotherly love. And agape is a, a sacrificial love. And it, it doesn't translate directly as our English word love, but we don't have any other word for it. When it's used as a noun, the old uh, Bible, including the King James, translated as charity. But charity in English doesn't have a verb form. So when aga, agape is used as a verb, in the Greek it's agapao. And that's the word used in John 3.16. And it, when it says that God so loved the world, it doesn't mean that he approves of the world, doesn't mean that he likes the world, it doesn't mean that he has warm, fuzzy feelings about the world, because the world is at enmity with God. It means that God saw the horrible, miserable state of the world and everybody that's trapped in it and decided to provide a way out. Amen. By sending his only son. And the reason that Jesus is his only begotten son, because God wants us to be sons and daughters of God, then how come Jesus is the only begotten son? It's because he's the only son of God born of a woman. Born clean from the very beginning. The rest of us are born into a race of slaves to the flesh. Which translates into sin and the dominion of the devil. But Jesus was born only begotten. We can be born again by the Spirit. But none of us were born into this world free and clean like Jesus. That's what sets him apart. He's the only one. And that's why he is the pattern for us. And that's why in order for us to have eternal life, it's in him. If you look at the wording of the scripture, it's in him, through him, by him. He can't be separated from salvation. If you want to be saved, it comes with him. And he's the Lord. And that's not negotiable. So, we've got a world full of churches <clears throat> sending out Many times missionaries that God never sent with a warped vision and a, and a warped gospel that God never approved of. And even in the midst of all this, every now and then people get saved, you know. But when things get straightened out and the gospel, according to Jesus, is preached, by people who are clean and have been really sent by God, the results are astounding. Now it can take a while. First 20 years of our family in the mission field, we didn't have a lot to show for it. Those 20 years ended with me getting kidnapped and it looked like the end of everything. We got back out of that kidnapping and God began to open doors and he launched us into massive evangelism and radio ministry and literature ministry. And the next 20 years are pretty interesting. But these last 20 years, 
We just celebrated 60 years of family ministry. Last January with my mom. It's just been a geometric progression. We haven't tried to organize a denomination. We haven't tried to put people under our control. We go around and we find people like this young man I was telling you about, that God's got us in on people like that, and how can we help them? How can we come alongside and help them do things that they couldn't do normally on their own? They can, they can be doing well, but on their own, they won't be able to get New Testaments or Bibles in, in their own language. They won't be able to get Bibles even in Spanish. And if they could, they wouldn't, they might not be very good, good ones. They would never be able to have their own radio station. Unless someone like us helps them. In other words, when God's already in the business of multiplying clean people, if we can come on with just a little extra help, everything can explode, literally. Some of these tribal groups have been so difficult. And you know what it's like up here. We've been working with some of them for all the 60 years that we've been in Columbia. But in the last 10 years, things have exploded. Like, I mean, you have a tribe of, of 100,000 people. And now most of them converted. And I don't mean superficially converted like we used to see. No, their lives totally transformed. Nobody else can, can imagine. So this is the work that you folks have participated in for all these years. I guess I'll turn it over to Pastor Bernie. But thank you so much. I just want to pray for you before we take off. Well, Father, we thank you for the message that your Holy Spirit had through Russell this morning, Lord. And we thank you for all the work that you've done through his ministry and through his family and the generation that they've spent in Columbia, Lord. We thank you for everything that's happened there. And Lord, we thank you that this church was able to be a part of it, like you just said. And it's all because of you, Lord. We get to watch how you personally show up in the lives of your people and how you help the lost, how you saved the lost. And Lord, I just, I do really just want to thank you. This message today through your Holy Spirit just was special. I know Russell's heart is, a, is as an evangelist, Lord, to reach out, like you said, not to get people under his control, but to give, give the people the help that they need. And we thank you that you've used him, this congregation, and many other congregations around the United States and the world that he's attended, Lord, where they've helped out financially, spiritually, with prayers, Lord. We know that this is all what it takes is to be with you and watch you open up the floodgates, Lord. And we thank you for his ministry, Lord. I ask that you would protect him as, and, and guide his paths as you have these years until the end of his days where he goes home to be with you, Lord. And we thank you for him and his ministry and his family for all their dedication for all these years. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ray. Well, uh, so here we are. Thank you very much for that. That was.